Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Balance Work and Career Change conference call. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode, and the floor will be open for questions and comments following the presentation. If you should require assistance throughout the conference, please press star zero on your te telephone keypad to reach a live operator. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Nicole Jarvis. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Kat, and uh, thank you all for attending this evening. You know it's not easy uh, later in the night, so we appreciate you being here. Um, as Kat mentioned, I'm Nicole Jarvis. I'm a Senior Manager of Programs at Cancer and Careers, and I'll be your host for tonight's webinar. Uh, just before we begin, a few housekeeping items related to accreditation. Today's webinar is accredited for CEUs by ANCC, NASW, the New York State Education Department State Board for Social Work, the California Board of Registered Nursing, and the Society for Human Resource Management. If you plan on receiving continuing education credit for this program from any of the accrediting bodies, please proceed with the following steps. First, you must register a call-in individual. Uh, participants who listen in on someone else's line will not receive credit. And second, you must complete and submit the evaluation and post-test, as well as pass the post-test. And following today's session, you will receive an email with all of this information, as well as the links to the evaluation and post-test. You can expect to get this email uh, by 5 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow, and then certificates will be emailed within four to six weeks. Also, please note that the planners and presenters for this program have not disclosed any pertinent financial relationships or conflicts of interest, and that no commercial support was provided for this program. Thanks in part to a generous grant from Genentech, Cancer and Careers has created the Balancing Work and Cancer webinar series. And this is to provide patients, survivors, healthcare providers, and uh, human resource professionals with concise, targeted information to help you understand a variety of issues that surround balancing work and cancer. Career change continues to be one of our most popular sessions, so we're very excited to present this topic again as part of our 2020 Balancing Work and Cancer webinar series. We often hear from cancer survivors going through a cancer diagnosis and treatment that has brought up different ideas and ignited new passions. Many state they're ready for a change at work. For some, it's that they're more aware of the value of their time and what's meaningful to them, especially when it comes to work. And as we start to talk about meaningful work, it is important to remember that the word meaning suggests that something is significant, and what's significant for one person may be different for another. Many people also assume that meaningful work means getting a job with a charity, but there are actually many other ways to find meaning in a job. This and so much more will be discussed in today's webinar. So to get us started, I will, I'm happy to introduce Julie Jansen. Julie is a speaker, trainer, coach, and author who's helped thousands of professionals find success and satisfaction at work, as well as find work that's gratifying for them. Most important to us, Julie is one of the original coaches at CAC and has been helping patients and survivors with their individual employment challenges. Following Julie's presentation, there will be time for you to ask questions. Um, in the meantime, you can type them into the Q&A box if you have them throughout. And for now, I will get, I will hand it over to Julie to get us started. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, so, as Nicole mentioned, so often at Cancer and Careers, we hear people say that after having cancer, they no longer feel that the work that they've been doing aligns with what's important to them from either a values or a lifestyle standpoint. However, it can be really difficult to either decide what you might want to do work-wise or if you do know how to actually go about changing careers. Um, engaging in a single career or a lifelong profession is no longer the way we really work or will work in the future. The U.S. Department of Labor estimates that the average American will have three to five careers in his or her lifetime and at least 10 to 12 jobs and will hold each job just an average of three and a half years. This means that changing careers is not only acceptable, it is expected. Um, more than one person having, or many people also holding either full-time jobs, part-time positions, or having their own um, side business, which is now kind of coined a side hustle. As adults, we tend to believe that we know all about the right and wrong ways to do things, um, and we're also kind of mired in our habits, so it becomes hard to change. Um, so in addition to giving you some very practical tips and a 
meaningful process about how to change careers, I'd like to spend a little bit of time first just making you a little more aware of yourself and how others may perceive you. Um, your attitude about wanting to change careers and um, how to go about doing that really influences everything you do and say. So if you're nervous or if you're angry or if you're apathetic or you're worried, this will show even if you think you're containing these emotions. And these are definitely emotions that other people don't find comfortable and easily affect the way that you will present yourself. Um, the world is definitely not a fair place, and unresolved feelings about your circumstances or your frustration can definitely jeopardize your ability to figure out how to change careers. It's really important to be flexible when you're thinking about changing careers, not putting up parameters that would preclude you. It's great to have a sort of crystallized, focused idea of what you think you might want to do, but flexibility about how you can approach it um, or taking a bridge job to get closer to what that new career is or whatever that looks like is extremely crucial. Definitely it's important in this process, just as it is with regular job search, to increase your energy and enthusiasm when you can, um, recognizing that your stamina may not always be the same as it once was because of your treatment. You may be suffering at times from chemo brain. However, if you can do something a little bit physical or something that can increase your energy and enthusiasm during this you know, pretty difficult process, I sug highly suggest you do this. Um, you definitely will create your own destiny when you're focusing on changing careers. Certainly no one owes you anything, but no one is out to get you either, and so people generally want to help. Um, definitely explore alternatives, even if you're focused on something different when you're starting out, until you realize that the option isn't for you. So for example, um, if you've identified a different type of job and you want a full-time job, still be open to a contract or part-time position. Um, in 2020, over 50 51, 52% of employers intend on hiring contract or temporary workers, and their intention is also to transition these people into full-time permanent employees at some point. And there are at least 50% of employers plan on hiring part-time employees this year, and that would be a good opportunity for you to put your toe in the pool of something that is in your career change interest. And then according to some recent research by LinkedIn, very recent, the in-demand areas for hiring in 2020 are artificial intelligence, data science, lots of different types of engineering, including robotics, site reliability, data and cloud engineers, cybersecurity, of course, is, is very big, full stack and back-end developers, whether it's JavaScript, Node, Angular, and CSS, cascading style sheets, um, so that's, that's coding and development. Customer success is always popular. Behavioral health, um, being in charge of, of revenue and being a product owner, whether it's in development or management. So if any of those areas are of interest to you in a new career, there's definitely a lot of boot camps and um, classes and webinars and things you can learn about those areas to see if any of those would appeal to you. But regardless of the type of uh, new career you might be looking for, your ability to utilize technology is imperative. Um, it isn't acceptable to use age or a lack of interest as excuses to not use technology. There are also um, things called returnships. While they tend to be geared towards people who have the specific past experience in something, so for example in financial services, there are some la larger companies that offer what they call returnships to people who have had gaps in their um, work experience and bringing them back in and hiring them full time. And there's a great site that you may be aware of called irelaunch.com. So that's I as in um, ice cream, R as in rabbit, E as in elephant, launch.com. And there are companies are hiring interns on lots of different levels, not just um, people who are in college, college students, but definitely people who are of all ages now, which is great. Um, your attitude about 
any, you know, your age or your race or your religion or your gender or your politics, whatever it is, is um, something that can also influence the attitudes of others. And it's a reality, especially that ageism and chauvinism and prejudice exist. So don't dwell on it and don't, don't put those things up as an obstacle in your way. Um, your career change will always take much more time and energy than you would expect, um, especially if it's involved, if it's involving a job, a job search as well as you know the process that you go through, through to think about what you want to do next. And timing is everything. You'll get impatient, um, so be reasonable in your efforts at time management and just learn to deal with the psychological impact of time passing. And finally. They're, it's an interesting market. Companies are definitely still hiring quite extensively right now. We know that there's lots of um, crazy things going on with the market and with uh, coronavirus, um, but there's still lots of hiring, and companies still see themselves as having a talent shortage. Um, and what's also happening is that um, companies are hiring cautiously, even though they may have a lot of openings. And so during the interviewing process, they're asking job candidates to make presentations. They're doing psychological and personality testing, background checks, even drug tests. So it's just important to keep aware of the fact that the hiring process is long. Um, so what do, you, what do you ask yourself if you're actually seriously contemplating changing careers? Um, probably you know, there's many reasons for thinking about making a career change. As Nicole and I both mentioned, there are some um, psychological and meaning meaning reasons. Um, your employer's circumstances may have changed. They may have reorganized. You may have been laid off. Or much more likely, you and your goals have changed, your focus, your desires, your interests which cause you to strongly consider making a career change. So no matter what the circumstances that cause you to rethink your career options, be reassured in knowing that it is natural at any point in life to think about starting over, getting a new job in your field with a different employer or an entirely new one. But I would urge you to get advice from trusted colleagues or outside career professionals before actually making that decision to follow your dreams. And so clients I've worked with um, in a process of career change have found that asking themselves the following questions are helpful when making the determination to seek alternative work. So the first that always comes up is what are your financial needs? Be realistic and make sure that you actually have developed a budget um, that reflects every single penny that you spend in your expenses. Um, and knowing what your drop dead um, um, you know compensation level is that you need if you change careers, and often people get concerned that if, if you change careers you 're going to actually earn less money that isn 't always the, the case, but many times it can be. What is your requ required timeline for changing careers, which is often driven by the first question about your financial needs and what your financial situation is? Um, who depends on your income? And what are alternative sources of income besides your salary or your comp? Um, and will your chosen new career path um, require any additional training or education or certifications? And other questions that you would want to ask yourself when considering a career change is, can you actually afford any kind of training or education? If it requires time off, um, can you afford to take an entry-level job or even an internship in your new field of choice? Do you actually have the stamina you will need to complete the training? And are companies actually hiring in your new chosen career? What is the competition? Are your dreams of a new career realistic given your circumstances and the environment in which you live? So honestly, answering all these questions will lead you closer to determining your next best steps in changing careers. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I've developed a three-step process um, for changing careers. In, in my book, I don't know what I want, but I know it's not this. Um, and so that in that book, it's a sim simple three-step process, and the, but the steps themselves do require um, a great deal of work and introspection and exploration. So the first step 
uh, well, let me just go through the three steps, and then I'll get into them in more depth. The first step is self-assessment, which is learning about yourself. The second is your ability to both identify opportunities and obstacles. And the third is what brings it to life, creating an action plan. So self-assessment, in my opinion, is always the first step. And I see so many people jump ahead and just start going out there and talking to people and looking at job openings and updating their documents without really looking at themselves and who they are and what they need. And if you don't know that and you can't talk about it in a succinct way, then I suggest you go backward and go through this process. So if you look at um, self-exploration and self-assessment, you know, it's nice to ask other people about you because people who interact with you, whether it's your family, um, a spouse, your children, your friends, people that you worked with, they have a pretty good idea of who you are, what your strengths are, um, and what you like and what you don't like. So that's always a big part of self-assessment. But also, um, I am a big fan of starting with your values. So, um, and, and by the way, self-analysis for some people is fun, and for others it seems tedious and a delay to the process. Um, but it also helps you with writing your documents and your digital profiles and interviewing, uh, preparing for the interview process. And even most important, self-assessment helps you build your confidence. So when I have clients fill out questionnaires about themselves or take simple assessment tests, um, they really kind of step back and say, I had someone say that to me today, oh my gosh, I didn't realize all the skills I have. I didn't realize what I'm actually good at and what I enjoy. And so it, building your confidence in this process is really key because you're going to have to go out there whether informationally or in, in an interview situation, and articulate all those things about yourself to others. So your values are those things that are meaningful to you, that motivate you, that fulfill you. Um, so what are the top five to ten most important standards or qualities that you deem as inherently valuable to you and your well-being? Your values can range from autonomy, building something, relationships, helping other people, to learning or self-expression or physical activity, achievement, and teamwork. And there's hundreds of values, and sometimes when people look at a value list, they feel like they should have all of them. Oh, my gosh, I should be spiritual, or oh, my gosh, I should be interested in, um, you know, build, building something or helping people. But you want to be true to yourself and really – pick those top five to ten that are the most important that you know if you're not doing work uh, that um, doesn't fulfill those, if you're doing work that doesn't fulfill those, I should say, then that's not going to feel good to you. The second thing is what I've coined your attitude. So assessing your attitude towards yourself and your attitude toward the external world is another really good thing to do for being in touch with yourself. Research has shown consistently that your state of mind directly motivates your behavior. In a positive sense, those people who possess an optimistic attitude about a goal or challenge are far better equipped to overcome any barriers to achieving that goal. On the other hand, an individual who has a more negative attitude will find it much more difficult to achieve his or her goals. So the areas that are crucial to examine are your self-confidence. We touched on confidence a little bit, Confidence, self-confidence is very key. You're not always going to have confidence, and all of us have areas where we don't feel com as confident. But you want to do what you can to bolster that. Um, your self-knowledge is exactly what we're talking about right now, really knowing yourself and being able to articulate it to others in your quest for changing careers, and then relationships are so important because you will not be able to change careers without the help of other people. And so um, I, I was actually coaching someone today who, who confessed that he hasn't gotten promoted in his company because he's not strong at developing relationships, and he knows he needs to do it. 
and he's already in his 50s, and um, I'm not sure why it took him so long to, to realize this. And now in his 50s, he's working with a coach to figure out how to be better at that, to know that he won't achieve his goal of progressing further if he doesn't do that in a better way within his company and externally. Maintaining motivation. Your level of motivation, you know, is different. It's different depending on your situation and your circumstances and the day you've had and if you're tired and if you're hungry and all that stuff. But it's important to think of ways to, um, to get your motivation up. You don't have to stay motivated every single day, but you definitely sometimes have to play mind games with yourself or give yourself rewards or set goals that are easier to reach so that you can stay motivated. And Speaking of goals, goal orientation is important. It's not a good idea to set ginormous goals like I will change careers by June 15th because that just won't work for you, but just to break your goals down into little pieces so that you can achieve them and feel good about it. And then finally, whatever it is that you're looking at as a new career potentially, you want to have professional commitment. So that may mean getting some education, reading, things, going to con a conference, um, which probably isn't a great idea right now, but generally um, on a virtual conference, um, and um, doing, doing things to get up to speed on whatever the industry or field is that you're focused on. Um, and then a couple other things as far as what I call your attitudes, your personality is your personality. By the time you were even not even two years old, you had distinctive personality traits. If anybody here has children, they know already what their kids' personalities are. So while aspects of your personality can shift as a result of experience and self-awareness, you cannot change the essence of who you are. So doing work that is not a fit for your personality will create utter dissatisfaction. Um, I once coached someone who worked on a help desk an IT help desk. The trouble is she was highly introverted and actually really didn't enjoy people. She did like IT a lot, so we were able to identify an area within IT where she was interfacing more with her computer than with people. Um, and personalities, there's a lot of great personality assessments out there. The most famous and valid is the MBTI or the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Um, on this slide, if you're looking at the slides under personality, um, people are m more introverted or extroverted. They can be more of an idealist or a realist, a little more emotional or feeling or factual or thinking, prefer structure or spontaneity, and perhaps be err on the side of assertiveness or acquiescence. So um, no, take a personality test if you haven't already done that. A um, couple other things, your interests. So. Well, it's not necessary to feel passionate about whatever it is you're going to change careers into. It is important to be pretty interested in what you do. Um, and so one of the things you can do is identify what, what appeals to you in categories like people and ideas and data and objects. So well, I'll take myself. I'm, I'm an ENFP. I'm someone who loves helping people. I'm doing the perfect work for myself in my own business. And um, I love people and I love ideas. I don't love data that much and objects I'm okay about. So I know that, you know, I'm going to be doing things that interest me um, and, also, the other, the only other thing I want to say about interest is whether you knit or play golf or paint or um, do anything, it's probably not going to be a good idea to try to change careers into doing something that might be a, a side interest or a hobby um, because it doesn't end up being about that particular thing. It ends up being either about retail or about selling or about things that you really don't want to do. Um, so, and then finally, what I call your favorite skills. So these aren't just your skills. And by the way, by the time you're 35 years old, you should probably have at least 50 skills, if not pushing 100. But the trouble that most people have is they're unable to, you know, open up a Word document and write out what their skills are. So... Your favorite skills, though, are the skills that you're 
definitely willing and interested in using. And sometimes what happens to people is that they get forced into using skills. Like I'm coaching someone, she did event planning. She never wants to plan another event in her lifetime. And now people are talking to her about event planning, and she's feeling forced, like, oh, I have to be an event planner, and I'm trying very hard to steer her away from that because she'll be miserable, but because it's such a, such a great skill for her, she's, you know, feeling kind of pegged, and I'm saying to her it's not one of your favorite skills. So be clear about assessing this. And so um, moving to the different types of work situations, there's, and this again comes from my book, there's six of them. Um, where's the meaning? Been there, done that, but still need to earn. Bruised and gun shy, bored and plateaued, yearning to be on your own, and one toe in the retirement pool. So when I um, first wrote the first edition of my book, it, it, I interviewed, it doesn't sound like a lot, but about 120 people, and I used their stories and their situations to identify these six work-life situations. And it kind of seems like they're all negative-sounding, like something's missing or something's wrong. Um, but I did label them in a way that people could relate to and understand immediately without any further explanation. So I will explain them briefly to you um, and, and get into just a tiny bit of depth about each one. So let's start with my favorite and the most significant, which is where's the meaning. So when Nicole kicked this um, webinar off, she mentioned that there's lots of different kinds of meaning and, um, you know, it's not just working for a charity. Um, so... I identified actually, um, I believe it's uh, 10 types of meaning. And so let me just go through them. And, you know, it's sort of important when you're listening to this to sort of think about yourself and see which types of meaning are most important to you. So the first one is rewards and challenges. So that could be new opportunities. It could be money. It could be recognition. And we all like those things, but they may not be the most significant for you. The second is an intriguing, attractive, or energizing field or industry. I often see people in certain fields like um, the fashion industry, the beauty industry, the, uh, the arts, um, sports, where they're just very intrigued by the industry and they're almost willing to make a lot of concessions just to be in that specific industry. Expressing your ideals and values. Well, you might argue that we all should be able to do that no matter what we're doing for work, um, but it isn't always easy to do that. So being very clear about your standards, your principles, your values, what's important to you, and knowing that the work you're doing supports that. Contributing and making a difference. That's, that's big time me, I would say. Um, love, giving back, sharing, changing, improving something that makes a difference for people. Um, solving problems or answering complex questions, um, changing or modifying or altering your lifestyle, your priorities or relationships. We all automatically go through that um, as we move along in our lives. And um, sometimes it's situational, like ha having children or having elderly parents or just, you know, wanting more freedom. Um, feeling very passionate about something. And again, I mentioned this earlier, it's not easy to feel um, deeply passionate about something, but some of you do feel passionate. Um, I, I coached someone a number of years ago who was very passionate about bringing water to um, different countries, and that was her that she got her master's in. Um, supporting a cause, that's the you know, charity piece, so contributing time, resources, or expertise, or advocating for a change, or promoting a mission, um, and then innovating or creating, and that's just the process of introducing or producing or imagining something new or different. And then finally, the tenth one is learning. So some people like to be on the upward trajectory of learning, gaining knowledge, understanding, developing expertise, either through experience or study or both. The most common barrier that people mention about pursuing meaning, and remember, this is probably the number one reason that people want to change careers, particularly people who have or had cancer. And so they get worried that they're going to have to decrease their income. And as I mentioned before, it might be true that initially you may not make the same kind of money that you've made as an employee in a career that you've worked in for a while, but 
eventually you will or can, and the focus is not, it, the key is not to focus on not making enough money, but instead concentrate on what your specific brand of meaning is and make it happen by being both flexible and creative and flexible and resilient. Um, so the next type of um, situation is been there, done that, but still need to earn. So these are people who have and continue to be successful in their work, but they'd like to do something different, um, but still need to earn basically on the same level for a period of time. So it could be people who have larger fixed in expenses like kids' college education or um, alimony maintenance payments or um, but believe it or not, the greatest obstacle for people in this category is the lack of a plan. So I've heard literally, I would say almost thousands of people say, I can't think about making a career change right now because I have to keep making the same amount of money. And so while those people are daydreaming about what they'll do next, most of them never plan the next stage of their career and say, well, I have to earn this amount of money for the next three years or five years or whatever it is. And the key is to go through the self-assessment process we talked about earlier to identify your top two or three job, work, career interests, to meet with a financial planner to align your career plans with your financial plans, and focus on doing things outside of work to move you toward your future work or career. And there's some questions you can ask yourself, you know, what's your financial situation? What is your budget? Have you met with a planner? How can you reconfigure what you're doing now? And what aspects of your future career can you actually plan to move forward eventually? Bruised and gun shy. Uh, this is a lot of people. There's so many people have had, I hate to use the word victim, but just been the recipient of a difficult or ever-changing workplace. Um, I don't really know anybody who hasn't had a negative experience at work. Um, so this category is geared towards those people who have been laid off or had a tyrant boss or they've been caught in caught up in corporate politics. And the really clear obstacle in this situation for those of you who might fall into this category is lowered self-esteem or confidence. And you don't need to be a psychologist to know that the ways to improve your self-esteem or confidence are to do things that you're really good at, to set goals that are achievable, we mentioned I mentioned before littler goals, surround yourself with a loving support group, learn new things, trust your intuition and act on it when you smell trouble and always have a contingency plan for your career. But the key is to get yourself out of that bruised and gun shy state that you may be in because it will be very difficult for you to go out there and explore and talk to people about yourself when you're feeling um, all beaten up. Bored and plateaued. So these people, you know, it's, it's pretty normal to be bored eventually. We all get bored. And so these people typically have done the same kind of work for a long time and they just need a new challenge. And so either way, the biggest obstacle here may just be deciding how to get out of your bored state. So the first thing is to always, always look at your current situation and assess what gives you enjoyment and fulfillment. You know, I, 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 I make it akin to, you know, a marriage where you know, there's no perfect marriage, and if you're unhappy, you kind of want to look at the things that are satisfying that you like about your partner and that you like about your, your marriage before you jump and go marry someone else. Um, some people do do that, but, but I would say that um, you really examine your current situation, your current work situation, and assess what, what is enjoyable and fulfilling, and then try to figure out how you can keep those aspects of your work, and then again, using your self-assessment results, identify and plan the kinds of work that you can do that will stimulate and challenge you out of your bored and plateaued state. So, um, you know, asking yourself those questions, first of all, how can you, what do you like about what you're doing? How can you revitalize your situation? And sometimes for some people, it's just, maybe I don't need to change careers. Maybe I just need to do more things in my outside life, you know? Um, so that's, and that, again, it's very common for people to fall into this category at some point in their, in their work life. 
um, yearning to be on your own. Um, these are people who really dream of being self-employed. Not everybody's cut out to be self-employed. There's actually um, five different ways to be self-employed. Contract employee, working as a freelancer, which is definitely the most popular type of self-employment, um, buying a franchise, buying a business, or developing a partnership with someone. And just a note about franchises, food franchises are the most popular, but also the highest investment and the highest rate of failure. Service franchises, service businesses such as um, cleaning or beauty or signage or pet grooming and tutoring, those tend to be the most successful. Um, the most common barriers, though, to being self-employed are knowing what it is you want to do on your own, make, making sure that someone wants what you're going to do, um, not just because it's something you're good at or you enjoy, but is, does the market embrace that? And then, unfortunately, the need to sell constantly. Um, that never goes away. There, you know, the, you, you don't just every day get emails with people who want to hire you. I mean, I've been in my own business 20 years, and I mean, I, I get some of that, but I still have to get out there. Um, maintaining cash flow is always a challenge. Um, feeling like you have a lack of a support system or resources or feedback, uh, that it feels lonely sometimes. Um, and then balancing your business and your life, um, I, I kind of like to say blending. Um, but those are some of the barriers that you face. But there's a huge amount of, I can speak firsthand, there's a huge amount of gratification in being in your own business, whatever that is. And you can keep it very simple or you can make it a little bit more complicated. And then finally, um, I guess people do, you know, eventually, quote, unquote, retire. But it's only about 15% of people who are retirement age, whatever that is. I'm not really sure what that is exactly, but they don't really want to work at all. So that's a low percentage. So it might be that they just want to stop doing the, the full force career thing that they've been doing. But they still want to either work or be productive or try something different. Um, people are usually focused on planning the financial aspect of their retirement, but not anything else, so not the work aspects. So there isn't a reason in the world that someone who is older can't do any kind of work he or she wants. And in fact, sometimes it's easier to get involved with a dramatically different type of work because many of the things that motivated you earlier in your career, like money and status and achievement, don't motivate you now. So um, looking at, you know, where you'll live, your finances, what kind of work, what have you always fantasized or dreamed about, those are some of the things to think about. So now we've covered the six types of situations that you can find yourself in. Um, and then now what I'd like to do is talk about step, um, step two, which is, that was all the assessment piece, which is identifying opportunities and roadblocks. So I'm an optimist, generally, so I've, I believe that opportunities are limitless. But how do you discover what they are? So for one thing, be curious about the world and things that you know little or nothing about. Talk to people. Get ideas. Um, I have a, a coaching client who's in real estate investment on a pretty senior level, and he's really eager to start his own business. He had one once. It was somewhat successful. And... Um, he started a family a little bit later in life, but he's just, he makes it a habit to just talk to people in his industry and related industries, and he gets so many great ideas, and he gets confirmation, and it helps him build his confidence, and it's just such a, it's just such a good tactic, and, and I think he's getting closer to coming up with that great idea. Um, definitely, of course, do research. Of course, the internet is awesome for that, but it can also overwhelm you, so I would take what you read with a grain of, with a salt shaker of salt, actually. Um, and then identify trends. There's so many trends that occur, um, you know, just there's trends in everything. And then think about problems that need solving. There's tons of problems out there, and problems are often an opportunity or things that just don't exist that you think you could um, turn into work of some sort, whether it's for a company or, you know, in your own business. And then as far as um, the other side of it, which would be the roadblocks or the obstacles, research and write down 
any obstacles that you think could inhibit or prevent you from reaching your goals or fulfilling your dreams and changing careers. Roadblocks typically tend to fall into these categories. Um, age, people can think that they're too old to start something new or a company won't hire them because of their age. And yeah, as I mentioned earlier, there is ageism. But there's also a, a lot of companies and individuals who want to hire someone who's got more experience. Um, we've talked about the money thing where people just think, oh, I'm not going to make enough money. And yeah, maybe initially, but some, you know, I'm a big believer in doing lots of different things for money. Um, I do that pretty well in my business, thankfully. I figured out the model. It took me a while. But um, it's, it's great to be creative about how to earn money. Um, time, you might feel like, oh, there's too much time. I have to get, I can't get a degree. That takes too long, or it's just going to take me too long to find something. And that's where I kind of talk about, you know, getting an internship, getting a part-time job, doing a freelance gig, um, filling filling it up while it takes time to, for you to get to that next career. Um, not having any industry experience. Um, there are a lot of companies that are still really focused on someone having exactly the same industry experience. But there's also a lot that don't really care about that. They care about um, someone's skills and competencies and, and what their achievements were. And then, of course, there's always education. Um, so that's the second step, so being clear about what those opportunities and roadblocks are. And then, finally, the action plan. So boring as it sounds, it's um, – really, really useful to have a thoughtful written action plan. So I actually am starting a new part of my business as a vocational expert, and everybody always says, what's that? So I can explain it, but it's basically doing an employability evaluation of people um, in discrimination situations or divorces or things like that. It sounds depressing, but my job is really just to evaluate their employability. And I have been stalling a little bit, and so today I – Called a, I have a coach. I called her. I spent 45 minutes. I put together a one-page action plan. I put dates next to it, and I feel like a new person. I, you know, I don't know why I haven't done that sooner, but I will, I will execute that action plan. And that little one piece of paper, it doesn't need to be 15 pages, is what brings a dream to life. And so write it down. Know it's going to be flexible. And set goals using the well-known SMART formula that was developed by Ken Blanchard and Spencer Johnson, um, specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and on a timeline. And revisit it often. And as I mentioned you know, earlier, run it by your advisors. Run it by people to see if you're kind of on the money. And so if you follow those three steps in changing careers, assessing yourself, identifying opportunities and obstacles, and then creating an action plan, I can nearly guarantee that you will be successful at changing careers. Thank you. Nicole? Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, I know that that presentation has always gives me something new to think about, and hopefully it gave you all some good things to think about as you consider changing careers. Um, before we head into the Q&A, I do just want to point out um, a few of Cancer and Careers resources that you might find helpful. Uh, first, if you have specific questions about your resume, you can visit our website and upload it to our free resume review service. Julie is the career coach who reviews them, so this program is a really great opportunity for you to get personalized feedback directly from her on how to make your resume stand out. Um, we also have a uh, job search toolkit, which is one of our publications that has a ton of information, um, 60 pages actually, of job search advice, sample resumes, and much more. We have our Ask a Career message board where you can submit questions directly uh, on our forum and you will get a response from one of our volunteer career coaches. And finally, our Looking for Work section has a ton of informational articles on conducting a career change, informational interviews, and building your online image. Um, we also have a number of free events coming up, both in person and online throughout the year. We do have nine uh, sessions remaining in our Balancing Work and Cancer webinar series. These are just a few that are coming up in the next few months. Additionally, we have our Midwest Conference on Working Cancer. Um, I do want to give an update that due to recent developments with the coronavirus, we are moving the event to a virtual platform. So if you have registered or are interested in attending, 
Uh, you can feel free to register and we'll be updating registrants with login details as they are made available. Uh, we also do have our national conference on working cancer in New York City in June and our um, accepting applications for our travel scholarship program through April 12th. So you can find all this information on our website. Um, now it is time to open up the call for questions, so Kat will explain how the Q&A works. Kat? Thank you. The floor is now open for questions. If you do have a question, you may press star 1 to ask a question on the phone. If your question has been answered, you could remove yourself from the queue by pressing 1. You may also type in the Q&A box. Again, ladies and gentlemen, at star one, please hold while we pull for questions. And we do have a question from Teresa. Teresa, go ahead. Yes, I actually have two questions. Uh, Julie's information, we can contact her through the site, and I'm registered on the site. So I would like to follow up with Julie further. So my first question would be, would I go to the site to contact her? Um, yeah, so you can submit a question via our Ask a Career Coach uh, section. Okay, thank website. you for that. My mm -hmm. second question relates to if you are a survivor, which I am, and doing quite well, um, is that a question? I know with the new HIPAA laws, they, employees, excuse me, employers can't typically ask that type of a question, but is that something that you'd recommend, Julie, that gets avoided? Or if you have survived, you know, if you have gone through the course of cancer and treatment, that's not something I'm ashamed of. That's something I'm extremely proud of that I have overcome and continually to overcome every day. And I think that really brings great attributes and shows character. What yeah. do you recommend when speaking on that, Julie? Um, yeah, so, Teresa, first of all, congratulations on doing well. I'm Thank you. Thrilled, we're thrilled to hear that. That's great. Um, you, yes, it is illegal, um, but yes, someone could potentially still ask you because people ask illegal questions, right? Um, it is a very, very much a personal choice, Teresa, of if and when you would introduce the topic of being a cancer survivor and if it feels right and if it's appropriate and if it's relevant. So it's really, you know, it's it's not, it doesn't typically tend to be something I recommend you introduce very early on, but that when you're developing rapport and there's engagement and they are liking you and you're thinking this might be the place for me, it could well be that you would introduce it. So I think the cadence of that is something that you have to decide. I can tell that you're an intuitive person. So that, you know, you use your intuition and your gut and make that decision. It isn't something that you shouldn't be proud of, but it's, it, it's, it's, you know, it's something that is so personal and it's something that probably everybody either has experience with or doesn't have experience with and they, so that everybody has different opinions and reactions, yeah. you know. And I know that sounds like a really general response, but it actually is the best response because it's, yep. it's just so personal. So thank you for that. And that was my feeling absolutely through and through. I just wanted to get another opinion. So yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, good. I would just add on to that also. Uh, this is Nicole. <laughs> um, you want to just think about the context of when you're introducing that information. Yeah. So like Julie said, when you develop a rapport with, with the interviewer, that's a really, you know, you want to have – them seeing you as an individual and as a professional first, and then those other attributes next, so that it's not Absolutely. just um, your cancer identity that they're relating to you, but also you as a as a professional as well. So Thank just you. thinking about the timing is really yeah. important. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Great tip. Thank you. Sure. We do have one more question on the phone from Mary Beth. Go ahead, Mary Beth. Hi, thank you so much for this seminar. They're always so valuable. I just wanted to mention to the group that a dear friend of mine who's very successful professionally recently mentioned a website called Upwork. Mm -hmm. It's just yep. upwork.com that includes uh, short-term consulting jobs as and virtual jobs as well as in-person jobs that might be helpful to people transitioning back. Yeah, thanks, Mary. But that's a very well-known and reputable site. 
And so I would second that um, that testimony. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else on the phone, Kat? No one on the phone yet at this time. Okay. Um, we do have another question uh, from Sarah. Uh, Sarah asks, if I don't know how many, if I don't know many people in my desired field, who would you suggest I ask for advice in that field, and who should I be comfortable asking for their time? So, it's a, it's a, they're all good questions. This is a particularly useful one because um, it is true that while you might think, oh, I would love to be, you know, a banana peeler, but oh my gosh, I think I only met one banana peeler in my life come to think of it, you know, and so the best tool, of course, is LinkedIn and, of course, your personal network. So jump on LinkedIn and find, you just type in the search box above um, individuals or companies, type in, in the individual search, um, banana peeler, and up will come all sorts of banana peelers profiles. And then you can just look at them and they'll, see, you know, depending on your settings, they'll see if you're looking at them and you can send, you know, do an, uh, send a uh, connection invite and just say, I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn because I'm um, thinking about changing careers and if you would be so gracious as to maybe talk to me, email, we could email each other or whatever. Or you just, you know, send a connection and say why you are and then follow up. But that's a great way to just find people who do it. And then, the, of course, the other is just to go out and talk to your friends and your family and your colleagues you trust and just say, hey, you know, do you know a banana peeler? I just think it's interesting and I want to learn more about it. And you're always positioning yourself like sort of in an information gathering mode versus, oh, I'm looking for a job as a banana peeler, you know, because that can be a little off-putting and people feel get nervous that they don't know how to help you. But if it's just mm -hmm. informational um, conversations, uh, most people, I mean, it happens to me all the time where, oh, I want to be an author, I want to be a career coach, I want to be a coach, you know, um, and I'm happy to spend a little bit of time, even if it's just a couple emails, to tell people what's, you know, a day in the life of whatever I do. So mm -hmm. that's, that's really what I recommend. Great. Um, I just want to make sure there's no one on the phone, Kat. We do. Um, okay. We have Carol. Go ahead, Carol. Okay. Hi. I wanted to know, how does someone deal with chemo brain? Now, you said you don't have to disclose to a new employer that you've gone through cancer and you're a survivor. However, when someone starts a job and it's new and they are dealing with chemo brain, how do you get around that or, you know, because I dealt with it not going into a new job, but as a survivor I had dealt with chemo brain and actually mm -hmm. someone telling, my boss telling me something and actually right away not even remembering what she said. So how mm -hmm. would you recommend if there's certain things like chemo brain or certain things someone is, some after effects of treatment, how to deal with it? on a new job if they haven't disclosed to the new employer what they went through by starting. Sure. So, Julie, cool. do you want me to take that one? Oh, uh, yeah. That'd be great. Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, Carol, that's a, you know, something that's really common uh, among, mm -hmm. you know, the cancer survivor population. Um, there the the best way you can really go about that is really trying to figure out what what challenges you are experiencing you know if it is memory loss um really taking steps to be diligent about recording things writing things down having a lot of calendar reminders um mm -hmm. you know there a lot of things that might seem kind of basic but can be really helpful day to day and can mm -hmm. help also help become habitual as well um, so we do have a section on our website uh, regarding chemo brain and just some, some tactics that you can take to address some of those challenges that you have at work. Um, our, web, our webinar that we have coming up in June is um, on occupational therapy and vocational rehab, and they offer a ton of ideas um, for how to address some of those challenges because they are so common, especially, mm -hmm. you know, uh, short-term memory and uh, the ability to focus. Um, if you are having a ton of trouble with those, it, it is possible to um, 
request what are called reasonable accommodations, which is through the Americans with Disabilities Act. And these are basically modifications in your work schedule or some of the responsibilities as part of the job that um, can help you to um, do, fulfill the essential functions of your job. So, you know, mm -hmm. let's say that you are allowed to record meetings or something like that. That could be something that's, you know, included. You know, it, it might include having to share a little bit about your uh, situation, not necessarily specifically your diagnosis, but potentially some of the challenges that you do have. So if you do qualify for one of those, you can say, you know, there are some cognitive issues that I deal with. Um, if these accommodations are put into place, I can do this job without a problem. Um, mm -hmm. So that is a, a federal law that can provide some of those protections, and they are available when you are looking for a job as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And we do have one more question on the phone if you have time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, this question is from Vaughn. Go ahead. Hi. Um, it's kind of piggyback from the very first question about asking uh, about your illness when you're in an interview. My my biggest concern is I've been out of work now for three years, um, and I'm approaching my five-year mark soon, which means that, you know, I should be able to, okay to go back to work. How do you explain that, like, a three-year gap in your employment? Yeah, so that's, I would say, almost the most common question that we receive at Cancer and Careers is that people are very, very concerned about their gaps. And the truth is, Vaughn, so many people have gaps on their resumes, and, and so for lots of different reasons, you know. Um, and so it really, it sounds easy, but it's just really sitting down, writing out one phrase or sentence to explain your gap and not and not you know if you don't want your if you don't want to say that you were I mean I some people do say oh I, I was ill and I'm now I'm great and better and I'm ready to go back to work some people say I had a family situation that I had to handle personally and I couldn't work full time while I was handling it but now everything's fine um, you know some people say I took a sabbatical some people said I got laid off and I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do next but whatever it is it's just something that you practice you internalize and you say and then you what it was coined by cancer and careers by the executive director I believe Rebecca is you spin it to and the reason I'm so excited about sitting here and talking to you is that I really believe I can contribute to blah 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 you know, so it's like you're feeling much, much, much more nervous and anxious about this guaranteed than the person who's actually interviewing you. Okay. Are you convinced? I, <laughs> I mean, um, it's, well, it's really I've, something I've that you that. have to practice, you know. Um, yeah. I'm not making yeah, light of this at all. I'm just, I'm just saying it's just really – It. And please – no, when I tell you it isn't as significant of a red flag at all as it may used to have been. Okay, well, that's good to know. All right, because my concern yeah. is when you hear that, because I'm a manager as well, and, you know, if someone told me that they had a family issue before, took a sabbatical, I would think, well, okay, what, how do I know they're not going to do this again, you know, or well, need this, this time off again, which, you know, is just kind of a circle, I guess. Yeah, well, that's you, and so maybe, you know, you have to rethink the way you, you know, you look at things, too, you know what I mean? Right. And it's sort yeah. of like, I know, it's, I know, I hear what you're saying, and and here's the thing, generally you need one, one job, right? I mean, right. you don't need 15, so you're, you'll find, it's what people forget, is you'll find, you'll find the one that falls in love with you and you fall in love with. Right. You know, or like even. I mean, it's not like right. you, you have to demonstrate, you know, talk about your gap and demonstrate it to 100 people. It's like just that whoever likes you is going to like you and want to hire you, and they're not going to be focused on that stuff. Right. Sell yourself. Right. Okay. Yep. And also it's all about potential, right? You know, it's not always about what you've done. It's about what you can do. And so really focusing on what, what you're able to accomplish is, is a really great way to kind of distract from yeah. any any concerns on on your resume that you might that you are probably much more concerned about than they are. 
They want to know what you're going to do for them. So if you can sell yourself in that way and not focus so much on what's happened to you or what, where, where there are any deficits, then it's it'll go much more in the direction you'd like it to, and you'll be in much better control. Right. Just move the focus. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's helpful. If they like you, they like you. And that's yeah. a big part, right. you know. Exactly. So, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, well, it looks like we are just past the hour, so I do want to make sure that we stick to time. Um, so I'm going to close it here. I do hope that you guys all found this webinar valuable, and we really appreciate your feedback. So as a reminder, as I put up here, we'll be emailing the online evaluation and post-test by 5 o'clock tomorrow. So if you could fill that out, uh, that really helps us to develop these programs to meet your needs. Uh, it's really not only helpful for us shaping the future calls, but also in, in order for us to receive the funding for these kinds of programs. Um, I know that there may have been some questions we didn't get to in the call tonight, so please feel free to email us at cancerandcareers at cew.org, and we'll be sure to get those answers for you. And once again, thank you so much to Julie for your insights, and thank you all for attending, and have a wonderful evening.